So the, the thing I wanted to, to go back to, because a lot of our YouTube commenters were a little incredulous on the idea of the UK, gov- the, the UK government still seeming like it's a, it's a threatening thing. And I guess from your viewpoint, why should we still be so concerned about the UK? Because a lot of people are like, oh, their time is behind. The sun is set in the British Empire. But you very strongly had connected Soros and a lot of what's happening to, to the British government. Why should we still be concerned, Richard? Well, first of all, if you're concerned about the UN, if you're concerned about the World Economic Forum, if you're concerned about all of these transnational institutions of global government that are presently making our lives miserable, then you need to be concerned with the British Empire, the British Commonwealth, or whatever you want to call it, because they are one and the same. Uh, There was a book written in 1926 by a guy named Alfred Zimmern, and he was a a British gentleman who was part of the so-called Roundtable movement. The the Roundtable movement was a movement in the, um, well, it started in the late 19th century, really got going in the early 20th century, but basically it was a movement of very high-level British statesmen and and other elites who understood that the times were changing and the British Empire had to change, that it had to stop being uh, an empire based on acquiring colonial real estate, and it had to find some other means to wield power in the world. So in this book, The Third British Empire, this man Zimmern basically said that the League of Nations, which at that time was the closest we had to a global government. He said the League of Nations was the third British Empire, basically. Mm. He said it was through this League of Nations, which, by the way, was a British creation from the get-go. It was something the British had been expressly planning for uh, more than 100 years. By the time and wasn't it Woodrow Wilson effect. a big part of the, a, a big part of the implementation of that as well? Because I know people have said that uh, the League of Nations was like a, a Wilson dream in some ways. Uh, actually, that was that was a, a propaganda position that in, in which Wilson and his handler, Colonel Edward House, were fully cooperative with with the British. But it was not really Wilson's idea, not at all. Um, it's very mm-hmm. very clear that the British were not only planning a League of Nations, or they, sometimes they, they'd call it by other names, a Peace League or the Parliament of Man. Uh, Tennyson was writing poems about the Parliament of Man back in the 1830s. And it was it was not only something they were planning and talking about in public writings, but there were there were what we now call NGOs. There were organizations started pushing for it long before Woodrow Wilson was born. And in fact, what happened is in in, uh, 1916, the uh, British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Gray, wrote a letter to Colonel Edward House, who was Woodrow Wilson's closest advisor, basically saying to him, look, we want to start this League of Nations, but it won't look right if the the British Empire is pushing this idea. People will take it the wrong way. It would look much better coming from an American president from a so-called neutral country that everybody trusts, and everybody did trust us at that time. Seems strange to remember now. Um, and so he said, "What we what we would like is for President Wilson to propose this idea of a League of Nations and to pretend that it's his idea." And mm. Colonel House basically said, "Sure, no problem." I'll talk to the president. We'll get him to do it. And it's one of the curious facts of history that this Colonel House had that kind of power to manipulate Woodrow Wilson. He he had um, a, a strange kind of mesmerism that he practiced on Wilson. It's not really clear why he had the president's uh, trust and obedience to that extent. That there's all kinds of theories about it. Some of them sure. get, get into the occult and, and things like that. But um, for whatever reason, he, he undeniably had a strange Svengali-like hold on the president. And this was very significant because Colonel House was, in fact, being run by British intelligence uh, at that time. His, his handler was a guy named Sir William Wiseman, who was 
then the uh, the station chief for, for British intelligence in the United States. And they were very, very good friends, uh, this uh, William Wiseman and Colonel House. And we have uh, a, a rich archive of now published uh, writings, letters between House and Sir Edward Gray and Sir William Wiseman, all plotting together how to manipulate Woodrow Wilson and get him to do what they wanted. And this becomes very significant when you realize that it was during Wilson's administration and it was under the Svengali-like influence of Colonel House that the income tax was passed here, that we switched over to the Federal Reserve System in 1913, that we entered World War I after w Wilson had run on a, a, a campaign saying he kept us out of war. Mm -hmm. And then Wilson obediently, as he had been instructed to do by Sir Edward Gray and Colonel House, Wilson then obediently became the champion of this uh, League of Nations, which was completely uh, following the British plan and blueprint for, for this international organization through and through. But that's where the plan failed because the U.S. Mm -hmm. Senate scrutinized it very closely. They brought in expert witnesses, including uh, a number of prominent uh, Irish-American uh, um, intellectuals who were very knowledgeable about the workings of the British Empire. Uh, these were people, for the most part, these Irish Americans, uh, people involved with the Irish Republican movement at the time, the uh, the struggle for Irish independence was going on. And uh, one man in particular who was a, a New York State Supreme Court judge, uh, his name was Cohalen, Daniel Cohalen. He was extremely eloquent in his testimony before the Senate and in which he basically said that the purpose of the League of Nations was to bring the United States back into the British system as, a, as essentially a member of the British Empire. And this was an explicit goal of the British Roundtable movement, which was really, I mean, we, we, we call it a movement. It, it was famously exposed um, by Georgetown University professor Carol Quigley, um, whom you may have heard of. Yes. But he... he um, in, in two books that he wrote, he exposed this roundtable and its agenda to, to, first of all, to, to create World War I, uh, to create a world war which would leave uh, the British Empire in a dominant position in the world, as indeed it did, and in the process to bring the United States back into the British system in some way or another, but uh, preferably the, what the roundtable people wanted was to bring it in as a sort of dominion uh, with the same kind of status as Canada or Australia or one of the other English-speaking dominions. And there were different different ideas about this. But my point is to, to, to those of your audience who are skeptical that Britain could wield such kind of power or could be this kind of threat is the... Uh, my answer is the simple fact that if you read their writings, if, if you read the Americanization of the world by William T. Stead, for example, uh, he, he was a, a, a British operative, a, a journalist, actually, but also uh, apparently uh, uh, an intelligence operative. And he was uh, Cecil Rhodes's handler. And he wrote this book, The Americanization of the World, in which he basically called for... Uh, the union of the United States and Britain. And this had already been, uh, this idea had already been pushed very hard by uh, such men as Andrew Carnegie, the great steel magnate, often described as American, although in fact he was Scottish. And in mm -hmm. fact, he never got his American citizenship. Uh, he was, he always remained a loyal subject of the crown. He used his vast wealth to start the Carnegie Peace Foundation, allegedly dedicated to the cause of peace, but actually dedicated to the cause of the round table and to its cause of what they called imperial federation, of, of bringing the British Empire into a closer, 
uh, sort of federal union and including the United States in it. Mm -hmm. So all of this was planned and basically announced publicly through books, lectures, articles, and you, we can read these books today, and it's very clear what the British were proposing. It's very clear what they were planning is to create a world united under British rule, governed through bodies such as the League of Nations, which pretended to be international bodies uh, 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 that somehow allowed the nations of the world to democratically vote and uh, on issues they had in common but in fact was rigged to do the will of Great Britain and its, uh, its Commonwealth. And so we can look at those plans laid out very clearly, and then we can look at the world today, and it's crystal clear mm -hmm. that what those men said they were going to do has been done. The, the world we have mm -hmm. today, whether it's the World Economic Forum, the United Nations system, and all of these supranational authorities, uh, the WHO, uh, et cetera, that are now in our faces telling us how to live our lives, these are part of the global government which the British Roundtable Movement foresaw and engineered and managed to manipulate the United States uh, to get involved with. Mm -hmm. And these manipulations took place on the level of intelligence. They, they were carried out by British intelligence uh, officers, uh, such as especially the one I mentioned before, Sir William Wiseman, who, by the way, has been called by British historians the greatest agent of influence that the, the United Kingdom ever had. And that is very high praise uh, for, for an intelligence uh, officer uh, of uh, MI6, which I, I think is, is by far the, the greatest intelligence service in the world, the most well, effective.